If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. I've had Ashley Church on before as well. Back then, we talked about our faith journeys. Today, though, I wanted to touch base with Ashley regarding his article about the Israel-Hamas conflict, its origins, and busting some myths that the media perpetrate. He joins me on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch and the first crunch of the year, Ashley Church. G'day, Cam. Nice to see you again. Welcome to 2024. I hope it started well for you. Yes, well, you know, it's uh, it's it's a battle always, but... Uh, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to this new, the first show, and I'm looking forward to RCR for the year. And uh, you. you know, we moved the dial at, uh, last year um, with RCR with the election and and all of that. So it's been fantastic to grow. But one one area that I keep getting criticism on is I haven't yet commented on RCR regarding the Israel versus Hamas war that's been going since October seven. Yep. And uh, I read your article that you wrote early on in that piece, a very reasoned uh, article that showed both sides of the arguments and, and what, where you saw things lie. And certainly I'd refer uh, readers to your website for that, which is at ashleychurch.com. And if you search for Israel and Hamas, the facts, you'll find Ashley's article. Just want to touch on what you cover in that article, Ashley. Yeah, so basically, the, the, where it came from was um, not long after this this uh, this terrible attack took place on the seventh of October. I looked around Cam for some Q and A material that I could use in, in social media posts. That, that was that was really the genesis of it, and and there was various stuff out there, but nothing that really covered the the key data, and, and also nothing which extrapolated from what had happened on seventh October and explained the history and why that had actually happened. Mm. Um, so I wrote one myself. And I, I wrote it, as you say, as a, uh, as, as a Q&A, um, and I tried to keep it as simple as possible. So it basically poses some questions that it answers the questions, and it doesn't go into a huge amount of detail on the answers themselves. It gives just enough, basically, to answer the question, but it's chock full of, of hyperlinks, which means that where it answers in a three or four um, uh, sentence answer, mm -hmm. there are also hyperlinks which enable you to go and find much more information and videos and other things for anybody who really wants to get down into the deep and dirty. Yeah. Um, so, so the the uh, and then I put it out there and it went mental. Um, it got picked up all around the world. Uh, it got picked up by um, agencies in, in the states and Israel and other places, and became almost a, a de facto um, sort of a fact sheet. On, mm. on what was going on, which, which was great. Yeah, it's very um, good. I mean, I've referred lots of people to it um, because it doesn't have any emotion in it. There's no right or wrong. These are just the facts. I mean, yeah. you even outline what Hamas is about and and what they want, which people seem to forget. And that's actually the starting point of it. But pretty much the first question it asks is, "Who is Hamas?" And and Hamas. So actually, the first question it asks is, "What happened on the seventh of October?" And it goes yeah. into a bit of detail about. The attack that took place at 6:30 in the morning, the fact that 1,200 people were slaughtered, um, uh, some of them, some of them in their sleep. They were people who, in many cases, had been in a music festival the night before. Um, babies were beheaded, women were raped. It was a terrible, terrible event. And had it happened anywhere else on Earth, can um, it would have been the the uh, the cause of massive outpouring of of grief uh, around the world. And there and, and there was a little bit of grief. It lasted about five minutes. Mm. Um, and then it very, very quickly turned into what we saw, which was essentially blaming Israel for the fact that Hamas had attacked it. Anyway, back to your question. Um, so the, the attack was, was, was conducted by Hamas, and they also took back into Israel about 240 um, hostages. Hostages, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, it's, at that point, it's interesting to actually ask who Hamas, who Hamas are or, or who they are as an organisation. So Hamas has been around since the uh, 1980s. Uh, in fact, 1988, it first emerged, and it now rules the Gaza Strip. It is effectively, well, not effectively, it is the, the government of the Gaza Strip. So just for those who don't understand the politics, uh, yeah. the Palestinian people on either side of Israel fall into two different territories. On one side is Gaza, which is the strip of land on the uh, south 
uh, east, southwest coast of Israel um, facing onto the Mediterranean. And on the other side of Israel is uh, another piece of land called the West Bank. And that's ruled by a different organization uh, called Fatah, which is uh, part of That's the where the Palestinian Liberation Organization eventually became Fatah. Correct, correct, yeah. And so Fatah is, is a radical organization as well, but it's nowhere near as radical as, as Hamas. So Hamas in, in 19... Uh, sorry, in 2005, after uh, a form of occupation over that territory by Israel, Israel basically decided that they would pull out of Gaza in its entirety. They offered um, it back to Egypt, didn't they? Offered it back to Egypt. Egypt didn't want to bar it. Egypt's got a big wall up that nobody talks about. A huge um, wall, it's bigger than Israel's. Wall, yeah. And so they basically left them to it quite quickly. The um, the Palestinians and, and the Gaza Strip had an election. They elected Hamas to be their leadership. And Hamas has both a political wing and a military wing, although for all intents and purposes, they are essentially the same thing. One and the same, yeah. Yeah, and so, and, and so determined were Israel to lead them to it that they actually forcibly removed 10,000 Jews who'd been living in Gaza, forcibly removed them, made them leave, and uh, removed uh, the graves of uh, for Israelis who had been buried in the Gaza Strip so that they wouldn't be um, desecrated. Uh, and left all the infrastructure in place that they'd left built. the infrastructure and basically left them to it. So there was no occupation. So when the term occupation comes up, there was no occupation. It was it was left to its own devices. It was funded primarily from from on the largest and support of nations around the world and the UN, um, and and it governed itself for for a period of of uh, almost twenty years. Um, and then they emerged, as I say, and 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 to be fair, I mean this didn't happen entirely in isolation. They'd been bombing. Israel with with uh, uh, monotonous regularity over that twenty year period, but Israel has this thing called Iron Dome, which is a very effective defense mechanism, which shoots down most of those missiles as they and come. For in. many years, they didn't have it though. That's right, and so it was it was damaging infrastructure in Israel. Anyway, so Hamas have emerged and and carried out this attack. You might say, well, why have they done so? So it's important to understand who Hamas actually are. Well, what they're, does Hamas a... mean for a start? What does the word Hamas mean? I'm not even going to attempt to give the Arab uh, translation because I can't. I can't pronounce it, but it's an acronym which means Islamic Resistance Movement. Um, in Hebrew, incidentally, as a coincidence, the word Hamas actually means violence, which is which is interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's driven very much by, and this is a key thing to understand, it's driven by the same objectives which motivated ISIS. And in fact, according to a number of leading Muslim academics, not not uh, Western academics, Muslim academics, they actually say that it is ISIS. So, so for all intents and purposes, it operates in exactly the same way. Um, it... Its purpose uh, as an organization is not the creation of the Palestinian state. It's not to have peace with Israel. It's not any of these things that the protest movements claim that it is. Its movement is the annihilation of the state of Israel and the establishment of an Islamic caliphate. And in fact, if you go further than that, it's it's uh, long term uh, uh, um, purpose, and it's made no secret of this, is, is a permanent state of total war and the, eventually the creation of a caliphate worldwide. So it's very clear in its objectives, not interested in peace, not interested in a state. It, it is determined to completely remove uh, Israelis, which it sees as the blight on that land from that, that area in its entirety. Now, by the way, that's not my opinion. That comes from something called the Hamas Charter. And the Hamas chart is available online for anybody who wants to read it. And it's very clear. It goes through what its objectives are. It goes through what its goals are. And it goes through its very clear attitude toward Jewish people and its desire for the elimination of, of Jews worldwide. So when they, when, when uh, green politicians and various other people march down Queen Street and yep. chant from the, the river, river to, to the, the sea, sea, Palestine will be free, what does that mean? So the so the river in question, when Ham, from a Hamas's perspective, they're talking about the Jordan River uh, on the eastern side. So the Jordan River runs pretty much all the way up uh, as as uh, as a line between um, Jordan and Israel, right up to uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, and, and down Eastern. to the Dead Sea, and down to the Dead Sea. Yeah. So so that's a that's a natural border on one side, um, and the sea is is the Mediterranean. So the only piece of land that exists between those two geographical features is Israel itself. So what they're saying is, from the river to the sea, elimination of Israel in its entirety. And that's completely consistent, as I say, Cam, with, with the, um, the charter of the mass, which that, that's exactly what they say. Now, the irony of it is that the people who, make, who chant that phrase and, and, you know, the people that protest and, and march in the streets that you just mentioned before around the, the, the streets of the Western world, in most cases have absolutely no idea 
what the river and the sea actually are, or which it would have been comedic if it wasn't so serious. But I well, it is video. comedic. Somebody's put a video out on YouTube um, asking protesters, well, "What's the river?" Exactly. And and um, no one can answer it. Uh, In fact, obviously, I think I saw somebody saying that the Balkans was the the, the the sea was the Balkans for God's sake. I'm yeah, curious. or the or the sea was the um, the Black Sea. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, just... Which of course, which of course borders Ukraine, Russia, and uh, and Turkey. Um, nowhere near this area. Um, same with the river; they couldn't name what the river was either. Yeah, completely right. So, so you know, it's very easy to to to, to make these these chants and to you know to get up and talk about the river to the sea. But when you actually analyse what they mean by that, it is an horrific uh, uh, call to genocide of the of, of the of the Jewish people. Now, just to touch on that, yep. How, how many Jews live in Gaza? None, not one. Yeah. How many Jews live in Syria? Uh, there'd be less than 50. How many Jews time. live in Lebanon? Uh, probably a few more, but again, less, less than a couple of hundred. And Jordan? Uh, again, there might be someone doing business in Jordan because Israel has a peace treaty with Jordan, yeah. but long-term residents might be four or 500, certainly wouldn't be any more than that. Saudi Arabia? Oh, none. And Egypt? Same as Jordan. They have a peace treaty with, with uh, Egypt, so so there would be probably a greater degree of commercial relationship between But a few hundred. A few hundred, maybe, yeah. Certainly not many. Certainly, we're know. certainly not talking thousands. Yeah, so I named those countries on purpose. They're the countries who have borders with Israel. That's right. Yep. And so when they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, what they really mean will be free of Jews. Correct. Absolutely just, correct. Just like it is in all those countries around. Absolutely correct. Incidentally, there's a there's a corollary to that question, which is how many people of those various different ethnicities live in Israel? Yeah, um, yeah. who who might have who might have descendancy or ancestry in those various different nations? How many Arab, Arab Israelis are there? Two million. And in Israel, growing. living in Israel with the same rights as, as as Israeli citizens. So so that then leads to the other claim that people make about Israel is that it's an apartheid state. The nonsense. And the only are, there, can... are there any laws that Israel has that prevents a non-Jewish person from, I don't know, being an MP or a no, judge fact, or a there teacher? Is, there is, no, there is one law and one law only that differentiates between Jewish Israelis and all others, and it's and it's actually a negative law for Jews. All Jews have to perform two years military service, compulsory military service. Uh, Jews of uh, uh, Israelis who are not of Jewish descent are exempted from that being compulsory. But there's plenty of Arab Israelis in the IDF, there are, yeah. and they do that voluntarily. But but in respect of the broad question that you asked, in respect of every other aspect of life, uh, completely equal, completely equal. So so the rights are the same. I think where this this uh, suggestion of apartheid comes from, Cam. Firstly, it comes from people who don't understand. So they say this stuff without actually having a clue of what they're talking about. Yeah. But secondly, it comes from a misunderstanding of the of the status of Gaza and the status of the West Bank. So Gaza, as I said before, has run as effectively as, as a, an independent state for 20 years. So its people are citizens of Gaza. They're not citizens of Israel. And I think if you if you postulate this claim that protesters do that it's been occupied by Israel and it's separated from Israel. That's the only way if you stand on your head and put your hand behind your back, you might be able to claim that there's some form of apartheid, but it simply isn't true. It's a completely separate nation. But many, many uh, Arabs uh, in Gaza actually worked in Israel, didn't they? They did, and it's interesting because that's clearly not happening at the moment for obvious reasons. And so uh, Israel is currently uh, bringing in uh, tens of thousands of, of Indian workers who who are very, very thankful of the work that was previously being conducted by Gazans. And the reasons Gazans did it was because the wages and the salaries that they were able to earn in, in Israel were substantially more than they could ever have earned in Gaza. And they they were uh, you know able to feed their families and look after themselves. Well, that's all gone. Ga Hamas has destroyed that. So what about the claims that this is a freedom movement, that uh, that there was a, a brutal siege uh, of, by Israel on Gaza that uh, wouldn't permit any water or electricity or all of these sorts of things, uh, foodstuffs going into Gaza? Yeah, so and that's not true. That's simply not true. In fact, there, was, there, there have been... Uh, 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 it has been an enormous amount of humanitarian aid that's gone into Gaza uh, since uh, Israel has moved in there um, after October 7th. 
Um, but about 70% of that by, by IDF estimates has been stolen by Hamas and is being used uh, essentially to support their soldiers and the people that are fighting the Israelis. So it's not getting to the people it's, it's, it's aimed at. And uh, it, so from Israel's perspective, Israel's actually going be above and beyond. It's doing things that you simply wouldn't expect in wartime um, of, 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 a, of a party to that, uh, that conflict. Um, and that's pretty typical of, of Israel, not just in, in respect of the provision of humanitarian aid, but also in respect of all sorts of other things. When they have moved into an area to clear out a mass, they have made sure first that they've let the citizens um, of Gaza in that particular area know. They've created clear paths protected by the IDF so that people could move move south when that was happening. They've, got, they've gone out of their way to protect the citizens of Gaza and done everything that they possibly could um, to minimise any casualties of civilians and to make sure that they're focusing almost in their entirety uh, on on the, the combatants from Hamas itself, which is in clear conflict to the nonsense you're hearing in the media about how they're attacking indiscriminately. That's simply not true. I visited Israel in 2014. and Great place, um, isn't it? Fantastic. It reminded me a lot of New Zealand, you know, maybe 40 years ago, this real can-do attitude. But uh, when I was in Sterot, um, being rocketed by Hamas uh, when I was there. Um, at one point, I think there's like 15 missiles in five minutes, uh, which is kind of frightening. But those people live there 900 yards from the from the uh, Gaza border um, yeah. with bomb shelters and all those. But I said to uh, the you know the people that were running the tour, well, "How does Gaza get its power and its water?" And they said, "Oh, from us." Yes. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, we've got a nuclear power station at Ascalon, another one at Ashdod, um, and we also um, pump fresh water into there Yep. Um, and provide most of the services um, there. And I said, oh, do they pay for that? Uh, no, we do it for free. Yeah. That's and uh, at that point there was rockets being aimed at those nuclear power stations which provide the power, power for Gaza. And I couldn't work it out. I just could not work it out. Extraordinary, Cam, the, the, the lengths to which Israel will go to to provide, I guess, what it sees as its humanitarian responsibilities to a people that it didn't create, who were created by events that happened in 1948, but who it has taken on a an obligation to, to, to play its part in looking after them. Interestingly, too, not just in regard to humanitarian aid, but even um, you might have noticed over the last couple of days there's been some reports around some IDF forces that that appear, we don't know yet because it hasn't been investigated, but it appear to have um, uh, killed somebody who, who uh, killed a Palestinian who for whom it wasn't apparent that they were a combatant mm. um, in cold blood. Now, the reason that's important, because and I'm sure there'll be all sorts of media about how terrible that is and, 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 mm. and how merciless it is was. Is this the guy that had his hands up? At the, yes. At, yeah. 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 So that's being videos. investigated at the moment. But here's what's important about that. That made the that made the evening news. It was the lead story in Israel. It's being investigated by multiple agencies in Israel. In other words, the the apparatus of the state, the apparatus of the military, is turning itself on its head to find out who did it, what the story behind it is, and to take action if they find that it was actually done in a way that was malicious. Now that, that now compare that to Hamas, who killed twelve hundred people in cold blood on the 7th of October, and have shown no regard, not just for the human life of Israelis, but for the civilians in, in Gaza, who it's actually used as human shields in order to protect itself from the, from, from the attempts by, by, um, by the Israelis mm. to eliminate it. So the contrast between the Western ethical values of Israel, which, which regards every life as precious, and, and the, the values of Hamas, which are basically bloodthirsty and will do whatever is necessary in order to achieve their, their aims. Now, it kind of moves on to the allegations that every time there's a conflict like this, yep. uh, where Israel reacts to defend its citizens. And, and this was a, let's put it plainly, it was, a, it was an invasion by what? Hamas, who yep. is the sovereign government of Gaza. So it was yep. an act of war against Israel on December the 7th. Uh, Correct. Hamas broke the existing truce that was in place yep. by doing it. Yep. And Israel responded yep. with Im immense firepower and yep. overwhelming thing. Now, there's this call that the protesters make that the response should be proportionate. Now, I'm a you know study military history. I'm a member of Antique Arms, so I kind of know all of this sort of stuff. In, in World War II, 
you know, when the the uh, Allies bombed Dresden and created a firestorm and killed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of German citizens, there were no calls for proportionate response then. When no. the Allies bombed or the United States bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, there was no calls for a proportionate response to the Japanese tyranny that was, uh, you know. So this concept of proportionality, Cam, has no basis. In well, I can't work it out because if you're conducting a war, if you're yep. proportionate, you're never going to end that war. It's going to be a no. stalemate. It'll be like World War One, where there was a proportionate response and is met with trenches and it became a, a four-year stalemate yep. um, that killed millions of people. So that, the, that's what happens, isn't it, if you have proportionate responses? Absolutely. And so your example of the Germans is that is particularly prescient because um, there were far more, and I haven't got the number in my head, but there were far more Germans killed during World War II than there were um, Allied forces killed. Um, but the and, Germans so were the and, and civilians as well, far more German yes. civilians killed. Yeah. But the Germans were the aggressors. It was the Germans who were attacking. So, so do we turn around? Should, should Churchill have turned around and said, "Well, we, you know, we have to pull back. We have to be proportionate in our response because we're t- killing too many Germans." That would be a nonsense. And I think any decent, reasonable person sees that there's a logical fallacy in that sort of approach. And yet, that's exactly what's being argued here. The other thing that's important to understand is that within that, you know, that whole, that that fallacious concept of, of proportionality, uh, the IDF is targeting overwhelmingly. It's targeting. Hamas, it's targeting Hamas combatants. Now, we're hearing all sorts of figures at the moment coming from the uh, Gaza Health Ministry of, of figures of sort of 25, it's controlled 30, by Hamas. people, it's, which is controlled by Hamas. It's exactly right. That would be like listening to Goebbels and the propaganda ministry during World War II, giving us all our information about casualties during that conflict. It's exactly the same thing. So, A, we don't know if that number's correct. And B, equally importantly, we don't know how that number's made up. And it may well be that the vast majority, in fact, I suspect we'll find it is when this thing, or when the smoke settles, the vast majority of those people are actually Hamas combatants. So, and then people say, well, there's women and children. Um, there are women combatants and there are child combatants. In fact, uh, Hamas has made a uh, almost a, a uh, science of using children as, as suicide bombers over the last 20 years. So this idea that women and children are somehow exempt because they're, you know, they've got some sort of naivety and the whole process is not well, There's true. plenty of videos um, out there yeah. of children in UNRWA, that's the, the, the refugee organisation created by the United Nations for Palestinians, uh, UNRWA schools where they're dressed up as Hamas terrorists, uh, you know, subjugating an Israeli um, you know, it was treated like a dog on the ground or, or got guns to their heads or being stomped. And there's plenty of videos of, of school-age children being indoctrinated under the auspices of the United Nations. And, Cam, that's another thing, and I know we're jumping around a bit, but that's a really important topic. So there's this whole issue at the moment around UNRWA and and what's going on there and this discovery that, mm. um, and at the moment they're only saying 12. They're talking about 12 UNRWA employees. Well, it's, it's, more than that. It's, it's more like 1,200. Exactly. So, so one employs about thirty thousand people, of which about ninety percent are Palestinians. There's there's only a very small number of those people who aren't actually. The rest um, are probably foreign foreign uh, nationals from, you know, various UN parts of the UN. UN, UN Del- yeah. yeah. Now, what's important to understand is that, it, it, and the idea that this has only just emerged and it's only something that's only happened and it's just a very very small problem. Oh, that's rubbish, problems. isn't it? There have been organisations for the last fifteen years. In fact, an organisation I belong to, the Israel Institute of New Zealand, along with David Kuman, mm. um, we, we've been bringing this information to the New Zealand government's uh, attention for uh, several years. We, we we had a meeting with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade about four years ago, where we outlined to them the fact that UNRWA employees have produced school books which teach kids to hate Jews and that yep. violence is, is an honourable pursuit um, that have been uh, that have been giving money to uh, Hamas for the purchasing of property, for the building It's worse than that, though. It is, it's not just um, perpetrating violence. It's teaching them that Shahid martyrdom yes. is, yep. uh, is an admirable um, Absolutely. goal for a child to aspire to. Absolutely. So this idea that all we've got to do is just re- get rid of bad apples and reform uh, uh, UNRWA is complete nonsense. It is rotten camp to the core. It is rotten to the core. It needs to be disbanded. And if there's to be an agency of that kind, it needs to be something completely different. And in my view, it shouldn't be run by the UN because it's proved itself completely inept and incapable of doing that. Well, I, I mean, I've been looking um, following um, you know, UN Watch for 
Yeah, probably 15 years where they've been yep. raising these issues. I understand it's more than 20 years that they've been raising these issues of, Absolutely. Uh, of UNRWA's inappropriate funding of yep. terrorist ideology. Well, those tunnels, the the 500, uh, almost 500 miles of tunnels that they've so far found in Gaza didn't, didn't make themselves. <laughs> they came from somewhere. Um but it, but it, it's it's just horrendous, and it's and and this idea that, uh, as I said before, this idea that it's just a you know a few bad apples and it can be resolved is is nonsense. And, and New Zealand and every other nation that funds this organisation need to cut funding completely and look for something completely new to to, to produce that. By the way, UNRWA itself is interesting because UNRWA was created um, in the wake of the so-called refugee crisis of 1948, mm. um, when when the two Palestinian states or, or, or territories were created. There, there is another agency that handles um, refugee causes around the world. It's the Office of the United Nations um, Human Rights Commissioner. And it's so so UNRWA looks after Palestinian refugees and the uh, Office of the um, uh, Refugee, uh, the other office looks after every other refugee in the world. Now, the interesting thing about um, the uh, UNRWA, UNRWA is it's got a very specific definition of, of what, what, a, what is a refugee that's different to anywhere else on the planet. And by that definition, the 800,000 people who were originally refugees in 1948 have exploded out to 5 million. So they now count there as being 5 million refugees 70 years on, which is complete nonsense. That counts uh, people that have uh, hang on a second. people that have moved to Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, moved on with their lives, had kids. They're still counted as refugees by that agency. But, but hang on a minute. Israel's charged with committing genocide. <laughs> I know where you're going. But yeah, the population of Palestinians has increased. What's that? That's five about five hundred percent, isn't it? But yeah, fivefold. Um it's a nonsense. So and, and but even if that weren't the case, just the, the international definition of genocide is clear. And and there are there are a number of different moving parts to to, to what constitutes genocide. One of them is scale. One of the big ones is scale, mm. and the other one's intent. Um and the scale would have to be if you want to look for scale, there have been conflicts in Yemen. Um, and and various other locations around the world over well, the last twenty years, where you've seen millions of people slaughtered. Rwanda, That's, yeah, those are scale. That's scale. The the, the twenty thousand that we're talking who are who are most likely mostly combatants is not scale. And the intent, Israel has been clear on its intent. Its intent is to remove Hamas from existence, from any form of power. That is not genocide. It's gone out of its way to protect the, the civilian citizens of that country, sometimes under, under duress, because those citizens don't, don't always want to be protected. Um, but Israel has done everything it can. It's done absolutely the opposite, Cam, of, of what the, the um, international definition of genocide tells us a, a genocidal nation would do if that was actually its intent. Yeah, um, so I, claim- I found that interesting that these claims of genocide started almost immediately yeah. uh, once Israel pushed back yep. uh, defending their country from an invasion. Yep. Yeah, and I thought it rather strange if you're a, a genocidal country yep. run by genocideers that um, telling uh, a civilian population that you're about to um, yes. inv- invade a particular city or an area, and perhaps you like might like to move south, yeah. would have been including, contrary including, to the goals of being um, genocidal, and, and telling them by uh, uh, dropping millions of flyers. To tell them it's happening, to ring every phone number, every cell phone number that they can get that, that they have, that have available to them from Israel, to actually ring them and speak to them in Arabic and tell them the attack's coming, um, and and so various different other ways. No army in the world does that. No other army in the world goes to those sorts of measures to try and protect the people that, of, of of the, uh, uh, the the nation where it's attacking. It, it in fact, in, they created a corridor uh, uh, of tanks. Yep. Uh, to facilitate the movement of those civilians yep. because Hamas were trying to kill them while they well, were Hamas moving. Was shooting them. Hamas was shooting them if they, if they tried to move south. So, so the Israelis were doing their best to protect them from that. It's, mm. it, it's the, diff, the use of language in this conflict is, uh, is stunning. The, the difference between the reality of what's happening on the ground and the language which is being used by the media and by the protest movement, the disconnect between those two things is like I, I have never seen uh, anything like it before. 
I suspect if I went back to to the period during World War II when this was starting to happen with the Jews then, we, we're probably talking about something that's on a similar scale to that. The difference this time being that the, the Jews are in a position to actually do something about it. They're not being uh, attacked by an enemy who's completely overrun them. We'll come back to the genocide in a minute because I want to touch on the, the you know, uh, ICJ uh, preliminary uh, orders, etc., but I just want to focus on the population, the, the Palestinian population, uh, and and the key date that everybody talks about, which is, of course, 1948, when Israel declared independence, uh, formed the state of Israel. Yep. Uh, the Palestinians call this the Nakba. They right? do. Uh, the, you know, I think it translates to the tragedy or something like yep. that. Yeah. Or the travesty or something. The trauma or something. The trauma, like yeah. Uh, and they say that, that that's the point at which they were dispossessed of something that they already owned. That's not true, though, is it? In 1948, no. there was no country of Palestine. Well, this is that, the funny that thing was that controlled that... by um, by Arab Palestinians. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting because the 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 the, um, the narrative again from the protest movement is that that uh, as you say that the Israelis overran an existing nation and took the land and that you know that they that they should be forced to give it back and that's based on the idea that there was previously a Palestinian state. Cam, there has never been a Palestinian no. independent Palestinian state in history. And don't believe me, go and have a look online. Do a search on great kings of Palestine or great events in Palestinian history. You won't find anything. You won't find anything because it doesn't exist. The the land, I mean, I won't bore you of going too far back, except to say that the, the Israeli connection to that land goes back at least 3,000 years and possibly longer. And, and uh, sorry, the Jewish, and Jews were part of that country, were, were, were occupants of that country through a succession of conquerors right up in large numbers, right up until about the 6th century AD. And what changed was the with the Muslim the success of Muslim invasions and the the invasion of Jerusalem as well as other parts of the Middle East mm. um, by by about uh, sort of 680 690 AD uh, the Muslims were really putting the heat on the Jews and there was a mass exodus of them off to other parts of the world to Europe and to mm. um, and to other parts of the Middle East but they continued to have a connection there's an unbroken connection of Jews to that land right up until 1948. Now, you, now, there were other people living there. There were other Arabs. Yep. Um, and the people we call Palestinians today are ethnically um, most likely to be of Jordanian descent or what we now call Jordanian. Jordan, mm. Jordan didn't exist back then either. So in um, 1948, though, it was a British um, protectorate. Protectorate, yeah. Called had Palestine. Since, uh, and and had, how did it become a British protectorate and at what stage did it become a British protectorate? Yes, yeah, so between um, between the 17th century, uh, sorry, the 16th century and the beginning of the 20th century, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, which was a Turkey state. Of Turkey, correct. Yep. And uh, obviously, Turkey was one of the um, the powers that Britain defeated at the end of World War One, and uh, that was essentially the end of their hold on the Middle East, and that was taken control of by the French and the British. And the, uh, the the British went about basically creating what they hoped would be democratic states in the Middle East. So they created the state of Iraq. Um, they created the state of, uh, they created Lebanon. They created Syria. Uh, Egypt was obviously already there. And they created Jordan. So they created the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. So we, although that's a kingdom, in other words, it has a king, Mm. Um, that that royal family was only created in 1947. In fact, that was created, and that was intended to be a Palestinian state because the the, the majority of the people who lived there were, were what we now call Palestinians. Ethnic. It was actually um, originally called Trans Jordan, wasn't it? Correct. Because it was That's both exactly sides correct. of the Jordan River, the West Bank and the other side. Yep. Now the land that's now occupied by by the Jews, Israel. Uh, that was the remainder of what had originally been a proposal to to create a much larger state. In fact, the talk of that started in 1917 under the auspices of a guy called um, Balfour. Hmm. And uh, Balfour, the Balfour Declaration was essentially the founding document upon which Britain decided that it would go, it would do what it could to actually establish a a, um, a, a Jewish state in the Middle East. Um, but but the, over the following 30 years, it was horse trading between the Brits and the um, and the the Arabs, mostly around trade, trade mm. links and, and mm. trade routes, et cetera. And they continually reduced that down to what was what was finally a very, very small sliver of land. And in 1948, probably driven by guilt of what had happened to the Jews during the Holocaust, the relatively newly formed United Nations voted on petitioning that 
The Brits walked away from it. They didn't want they didn't want a bar of that, so they voted against the petition and then left. And that newly uh, created state was was um, created in June 1948. Um, the following day, oh, and I should I should mention too when that happened uh, in the weeks leading up to that, because obviously the 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 the, um, the the Jews were aware that this was all taking place at the UN. The Jews put a call out to the um, to the Arabs that lived in Israel at the time and said, "Stay here and work with us, and we will build a new mm. country." And some did, and some did. Well, the two million that are there now. They are mainly the descendants of the people that decided to stay. So, so they became uh, citizens of Israel, like any other citizen, and have full rights, just like any other Israeli does. The ones that did, that, but, but the remaining um, states of the Middle East um, put the call out to those that live there and said, "No, don't stay. Um, basically, leave. escape to the leave, escape to the borders, because we're going to move in and we're going to clean out the Jews, and then you can go back." And home for again. those who left and went to Syria and Lebanon and yep. and Jordan. And Egypt, terribly. what happened to them? Well, they were treated terribly. So, so that's the other. It's They're still in camps, point. aren't they? They are. So there are there are Palestinian refugees in in all of those countries, as well as on the borders of Israel. But you don't hear about those others because that's not that that doesn't fit the narrative around the you know the terrible colonial uh, Israeli aggressors. So there are Palestinian refugees in all sorts of places. But the ones that that we we hear about today are, are, are the ones that went to both sides of Israel to Gaza, the Gaza Strip that we talked about before. And to to the West Bank, which is bordered by mm. um, Jordan on one side and Israel on the other. Now, here's what's interesting: is the Gaza Strip was actually annexed by Egypt uh, mm. up until 1967. So Egypt actually controlled the Gazan Palestinians for a long period of time after the war. Well, it was part of part of Egypt, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai, and in um, in uh, in uh, 1966. Yeah, uh, and here's the thing, Cam: the, the Egyptians found it unmanageable. And they, they pulled out. They don't want a bar of it. And since then, they've built a, a massive Great Wall, um, which you never hear about in media because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, and, and you know, because in my view, the best solution to the problem there would be basically to let Egypt annex it again and take it into Egypt and make it part of Egyptian territory. But that will never happen. The Egyptians will so, never do So that. in 1948 was the creation of the State of Israel. Yep. Right. Between 1917 and 1948, it was a British protectorate. Correct. Uh, France obviously uh, had a, had a bit, of, bit to say in Syria and uh, Lebanon. Yep. Uh, for that period of time, prior to 1917, uh, it was a part of the Ottoman Empire. Correct. And from about 1566, uh, if uh, if my history serves me right, uh, that that area was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Absolutely correct. And before that. Uh, a, seri a series, a of, series of empires, for, including the the uh, Seljuks uh, and uh, Egyptian, various different Egyptian uh, yeah. military uh, dictatorships for several hundred years before that as yeah. well. Ten, so ten in total, ten in total between about six thirty two and nineteen seventeen, or ten different um, yeah. caliphates in charge of that territory, all Islamic. Yeah. So none of none of which had a base in in, in uh, the, the territory that we we now refer to as Palestine. They were all based elsewhere, somewhere in Egypt, somewhere in Turkey. And of course, the name like Palestine comes from the Romans. It was a Latinization of Philistines. Correct. So, uh, and, so and biblically, the Philistines lived in Gaza. They did. They lived in Tyre, and, and which is which is and and also down in Gaza. And and what's interesting about the Philistines, there is no. Absolutely no ethnic link between the Philistines, who disappeared from history, and, and and the people that we now refer to as the Palestinians, who we know where they've come from. They've come from other parts of the Middle East. So so they are, you know, it's one of the questions I get asked is, is, is well, does that mean there's no Palestinians? Well, you, of course there's Palestinians, in the yeah, same way that New Zealanders and Australians are a people that didn't exist three years ago. Well, it's like, it's like saying, it, you know, such thing as, as um, you know, uh, Cappadocians, um, when in fact they're yeah. all Turks, right? Because the, the Ottoman Empire encompassed all of that area, and now they all become Turks. Yeah. Um, but the point I was going to make was it's 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 okay to refer to them as Palestinians. There's nothing wrong with that. No. But don't confuse that with the historical people that lived in that territory because they're not the same people. They're a completely different people. So this idea that there's a link between them to somehow form this this imaginary mm. um, tie to the land that doesn't exist is historically inaccurate. Okay, so that's given a little bit of history and everything. So now we get to the main charge uh, that is hurled at Israel that they're committing genocide. And we've just yep. seen uh, South Africa 
take a case to the ICJ, we uh, the International Court of Justice, uh, accusing Israel of genocide. But they didn't find that in their no. uh, in their finding. That ironically, they announced the day before uh, National Holocaust Remembrance Day. Yeah, International Remembrance Day. Um, yeah. Kind of rude of of them to do that. But anyway, they did. The only orders they made, though, in that, and and it hasn't been reported in the media, uh, they made no orders um, of Israel. They said you've got to be careful, and the Israelis said thank you very much. We will be careful. But they the only order they made was for Hamas to release the hostages. Correct. It, there's, a, there's a slightly different slant on the orders. So the orders were more in the nature of asking somebody if they're still bashing their wife. Mm. In, in that, in that, you know, there's no possible answer to that because if you're not, uh, you know, what do you say? So basically, they gave five orders which which had an inference that something bad was going on and Israel should stop doing it but without any evidence that there was anything. And Israel basically came back, as you say, and said, well, we're happy to comply with those because we're not doing them. Mm. Um, there was also an inference that there will be a subsequent, and, and it's worth pointing out that the lowest threshold for proving a genocide was at this early stage because there is no evidence. Did not, mm. South Africa didn't actually produce any evidence. They produced um, headlines and quotes made by people that didn't actually produce any evidence of genocide. There will be probably a more substantive report that will get two or three or four years' time, which be completely meaningless, but you're absolutely correct, Cam. In respect of what came out of that tribunal's finding um, a few weeks ago, there was no finding of genocide. Now, that's in contrast to when you go online now on social media, you'll see people talking about how even the ICJ CJ has found uh, that Israel was committing genocide. It's yeah. nonsense. It's not true. Yeah, people, so, like, people like Martin Bradbury and John absolutely. Linto and all the you know yep. screaming skulls out there that, um, that hate Israel and Jews. Yep. They're the yep. ones who are all saying that. But the only order that was given by the ICJ was for Hamas to hand over the tur the the, tur yep. uh, the uh, hostages. Absolutely correct. And it was interesting because they almost gave those, they, and this probably gives even more credence to it, because when you watch that uh, the, the deliverance of that, it was done through gritted teeth, uh, mm. which means that, that that tribunal would have, if it could possibly have found anything that it could have. They would have. Uh, they would have, uh, because they certainly weren't uh, partisan toward Israel, quite the opposite. Um, but they, they were unable to find any evidence of genocide. Why? Because there isn't genocide going on there for all the reasons that I explained before. Um, so that was that was a kangaroo court. It was jacked up by by that claim from South Africa. All the weight was given to South Africa, by the way. It was interesting. Germany uh, inserted itself as a party to those proceedings. And, and its reason for that, and I thought it was actually pretty gutsy of Germany to do it, was because if any nation understood genocide, it would be them. Well, they wrote the um, manual, didn't they? They did, and they they inserted themselves in, uh, on the side of Israel and said, "Well, we want to be heard because this isn't genocide. We'll tell you what genocide looks like." So, uh, did, and that's been so, given no weight. Yeah. So, did South Africa do this out of the out of the um, uh, their great benevolence and and uh, the, their concern for the Palestinian people? Or no, is there well, some ulterior motive there? Yeah, when it first happened, the claim was that they were doing it because they understood apartheid and, you know, that they would... All of that's nonsense. What we've learned since then is that the whole thing was funded by by Iran, um, who uh, apparently had paid uh, off uh, ANC debt. Um, so so this is this is a, basically a, a, an incident of, of one hand scratching the other. So this was purely... This was another ploy by Iran, and we haven't talked about Iran yet. This was another ploy by Iran to try and influence public opinion and world opinion on what's going on in Israel by using proxies. So in this case, but, but, how Africa much was, was the how much was this debt? Is, is it you know like fifty thousand or something like that? Oh no, no, we'd be talking. I, I don't know what it is, but we talk millions. Well, I do. I took the liberty of looking it up. Right, it's one hundred and twenty million rand. So there you go. So thirty pieces of silver. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and also, um, that, that's a debt that the ANC had, and they were about to be um, uh, have a judgment lodged against them, which means that the ANC would have ceased to exist as a political party, and that would have been the end of the government in wow. South Africa. And wow. a few days after the 7th of October, the Minister of Foreign Affairs visited, of South Africa, visited Iran, and then the government of South Africa expressed solidarity with the pa Palestinians to them to you know, 100 percent in a public display broadcast on television, yep. and then magically, 120 million rand drops into the ANC's accounts, and they've managed to pay off their debt. 
But I'm told uh, that the legal team that was assembled for this genocide case in the ICJ would have cost not less than two hundred million to prepare and argue for the final trial, and Which it'll be about one point five million billion rand for the whole thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is Iran uh, meddling in world affairs to promulgate their uh, terrorist beliefs, actually. And that's not new, Cam. So Iran's a known um, majority contributor to, to Hamas in Gaza. Mm. It has been for, for a very long time. It also funds another terrorist organisation in Lebanon called Hezbollah, uh, which is involved in similar sorts of activities. In fact, they've been, at the same time this has been going on, they've been firing missiles into oh, uh, next. northern Israel. Exactly, they'll be next. Um, but also various other organisations around the world. I, I, Iran is, is a massive player in funding terrorist activities around the world. And this was just another part of that process. Now, it's interesting because, well, you know, two of us talked about this. It sounds like conspiratorial old men. Go and check it out. Don't don't take my word for it. Don't take your word for it. Go and actually check out the various headlines, even, you know, tomes that are not uh, particularly well favoured toward Israel, like the New York Times and The Guardian in the UK. Um, go and read the stuff in those publications because as much as they might be gritting their teeth when they say it, they've all written about it. So so it's it's not hard to understand. Follow the money, the old saying, follow the money. It's mm. not hard to, hard to understand where this stuff's coming from and why. Iran's made no secret over the last 20 or 30 years of its determination to eliminate the Jewish state, and this is just another part of that process. I see in the news uh, on Wednesday morning, um, that Israel has discovered in the tunnels vast quantities of cash uh, yeah. and uh, uh, proof that Iran has been funding to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, uh, US dollars, uh, Hamas, and they've discovered this in the tunnels. So the evidence is building now of, yeah. of Iran's malign influence in these conflict areas that if they hadn't funded Hamas and Hezbollah and these other organisations, then maybe we would actually have peace in the region. Yeah, I don't know whether we'd have peace, but we would have the whole thing would have would have played out differently uh, because they wouldn't have had the resources. Hamas and Hezbollah wouldn't have had the resources um, that they've had, um, and so so the result of the whole thing would have been different. But it's 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 a unique it's a unique period of history when you've got a terrorist organisation running essentially a nation because that's what Gaza is. Uh, and world opinion um, uh, coming down heavily, certainly for the first part of this conflict, in favour of that terrorist organisation. I've never seen anything like it. The one good thing about it is that you would have noticed this too over the last few months as more information has come out and as that information has tended to support the Israeli position, that the mood is sl slowly, too slowly for my liking, but the mood is changing. The mood of the world is changing. And you're not even seeing the same degree of activity from the protest groups that you were seeing in that first couple of months. Um, they've gone a lot more quiet, and you're hearing a lot more from nation states that are actually finally coming down one side or the other and supporting Israel. Um, so that's heartening, but, but it should have happened four months ago. What I can't get over uh, is the absolute denial of the atrocity yep. that occurred on October the 7th. Now, totally. I was invited to to a briefing uh, to see uh, the, the the footage that was actually from Hamas cameras of what went on. It's the most harrowing 40 minutes I've ever seen. And, and yes. you know, being a, a student of war and uh, understanding these things and, and having you know, relatives that served in Gallipoli and, uh, and in Vietnam, uh, you know, nothing could prepare me for those no. sights and sounds that I that I witnessed. People ask me why did I why did I watch that, and um, I gave the same answer that uh, General Eisenhower gave at the end of World War Two, when he was inspecting the death camps, and uh, he said, "Get the media in here, get the press in here, yep. record everything, photograph it, video it," because, and this is a quote, "Some bastard." somewhere down the track we'll is going to deny this ever happened. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I yeah. I watched that and it was appalling. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, pe people say that, you know, oh, the beheading of babies didn't happen. Well, they, they in the videos that I saw, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, it took and me, it took, just, to, just to put it in perspective, right? I'm a fairly – tough sort of a guy, right? I could not speak for hours after that. 
it was so shocking. Even, um, you know, I mentioned before the New York Times, and they're, they're certainly not partial to what Israel, uh, no. they did They did an investigation, which I, I, I honestly believe when they, they started, they thought was going to find the opposite. They were going to find that it had been exaggerated by the IDF. And they came out with an absolutely stunning uh, indictment of Hamas, the sexual crimes that they'd committed, the repeated mm. rapes, what had happened during that time, mm. um, which, and, you know, this is the New York Times we're talking, uh, which moved the dial on that debate quite substantially about two months ago. Yeah. Um, and we'll see more of that, I think, as the history of this thing slowly plays out and we see more and more of what actually took place. This will be, albeit not on the same scale, but this will be every bit as horrific as as some of the detail of what took place during the Holocaust, which which raises an interesting question, Cam, because it is that this stuff keeps happening to the Jews. This yeah. stuff keeps happening. And this is not new. The Holocaust wasn't the first time. This stuff's been going no, on. No, there's for been pogroms and all sorts. Yeah. And so it raises, yeah, and it raises a question. And in my article, I actually, like when I get to the end of the article, I say, "Why does this happen? Why is it because it's anti-Semitism? Where does it come from?" And for me, and this is getting into airy fairy stuff for some people, you you simply can't justify this on rational grounds. You can't. You cannot find a logical cause for this. It's, you cannot argue logically why people would ignore the reality and the facts and hate the Israelis and the Jews in the way that they do right around the Western world. You have to look at it and say there is something else at play here that's not normal because otherwise why do people act this way toward Jews in a way that they don't toward any other nation in history? And that for me, and I suspect for you, is one of the big reasons I'm so motivated to do what I can. Yeah, I'm motivated by a number of reasons. Um, One is my core religious beliefs. Same. Uh, the second thing is, is that I believe that the mainstream media uh, are, are propagating lies about Israel and lies about the conflict and lies about uh, the integrity of the government of Gaza in, in the form of Hamas. And I see it as a responsibility uh, to be the other side of the narrative, to be the balance because the balance is missing in our New Zealand media and indeed in worldwide media on these issues. It's a a terrible blindness that the media uh, and Western nations have when it comes to dealing with Israel. Couldn't agree with you. And so I see it as my responsibility to be the balance and not to get tied up in emotional arguments and and silly arguments, just deal like we have today in a nice rational conversation dealing with facts, verifiable facts, independently verified facts that these things happened, that these this is why this is happening and this is what the history is and this is the history of the area and all of those sorts of things. Because if you fail to understand history, then you fail, then you are doomed to repeat the errors of that history. Totally. And uh, so that's why I subjected myself to watching that video. That's why I've been vocal in other media platforms. But I wanted to take the heat out of this debate, uh, despite multiple calls, you know, for months on end uh, for me to to cover this on the show, I wanted to do it in a calm and rational manner uh, in keeping with, you know, my new, my new uh, persona, so to speak. <laughs> nice Hello. cam, right? And so, uh, Ashley, I thank you for coming on the show today to, to well. rationally explain that uh, without getting into any uh, heated arguments or um, uh, discussions about we're just dealing with facts and I and I implore people to go to your website that's easy to find do a search for ashleychurch.com and uh, search for Israel and Hamas the facts uh, you'll find a very good sum- summation with huge numbers of links uh, to this conflict and hopefully people will understand it a little bit better and uh, and look on uh, the me- on the news that they're getting from the mainstream media as uh, as suspicious as to its uh, origins. Thanks, mate. Always enjoy our time, and I look forward to our next chat on whatever topic it might be. Well, you're welcome on the crunch at any time, Ashley. Thank you for coming. Take care. Talk soon. I really recommend you seek out Ashley's article. It is very, very informative. Search for ashleychurch.com, Israel and Hamas, and you'll find it easily. It's a difficult topic to discuss dispassionately, but I reckon we gave it a good go. Let me know your thoughts on this topic, good or bad, by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. 
Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.